Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module, Crime and Punishment. This module will have three lectures, Concept of Crime, Theories of Punishment and Legal Remedies in Civil Cases. And we begin with the concept of crime. We have seen this before. What is crime? The term crime has not been defined in any statute. So, there is no statute that defines this word crime. However, we all know what a crime is. So, crime has been known through customs, it has been known through traditions and it is what a society says is a crime. So, basically, while it is difficult to define crime, then to a lot number of jurists, social scientists, criminologists and thinkers have endeavored and evolved different definitions of crime, each emphasizing a particular aspect of crime and looking at crime from a particular angle. So, basically you can look at a crime from several different angles and depending on your viewpoint, you can define a crime. So, because there are different viewpoints, so none of these definitions are very precise, none of them is a fully satisfactory definition and all of these definitions are just highlighting different viewpoints of crime. And essentially, crime is what a particular society at a given time says is a crime. So, it reflects the values of the society. And as societies change, the definitions of crimes or what all things are considered to be crime keep on changing. So, for example, some time back, in our country, homosexuality was a crime, today it is not. Whereas, things that were not crime before have now been incorporated into the definitions of crime. Here are some definitions of crimes by different theorists. Blackstone says that a crime is an act committed or omitted in violation of a public law forbidding or commanding it. So, basically, if you do something that is forbidden or you omit to do something that you have to do because of some public law, then you will call it a crime. However, this definition falls short because if something is not defined to be a crime in a public law, then this definition would say that it is not a crime. Whereas, a large number of crimes could be so devious as to shake the moral fabric of the society. But this definition would say that it will not be a crime until and unless it is defined to be so in certain statute. Another thinker, Sir James Stephen, says that crime is an act which is both forbidden by law and revolting to the moral sentiments of the society. When it says it is both, it means that if something is forbidden by law, but is not revolting to the moral sentiments of the society, then it is not a crime. And we have seen before that a large number of laws through history have been made that have made certain things to be criminal, whereas they were quite attuned to the moral fabric of the society. So, for example, we looked at the salt laws and in the case of salt laws, the Britishers made collection or processing or storage of salt to be crime, whereas salt is so basic to our food that this did not shake the moral fabric of the society. And so, the society did not consider it to be a crime, even though it was written in the law that it is crime. And so, with time, this law got repeated. So, this is what Sir James Stephen is emphasizing here. We will call something to be crime only when it is both forbidden by law and is revolting to the moral sentiments of the society. 
Similarly, if something is revolting to the moral sentiments of the society, but is not forbidden by law, we will not call it a crime. For example, if you are going somewhere and you find that a child is drowning in a lake and you know how to swim and even though you know how to swim and you are finding that there is a child that is in mortal danger of, of dying, then too you do not do anything. Now, in that case, it might appear to be quite morally repugnant to a large number of people in the society. But because the law does not say that it is a crime not to save this child if you know swimming, so this definition would say that it is not a crime. So, crime requires both these things. It should be forbidden by law and it should be revolting to the moral sentiments of the society. Then Professor Kenny says that crimes are wrongs whose sanction is punitive and is no way remissible that is able to be pardoned by any private person, but is remissible by the crown alone, if remissible at all. So, Professor Kinney is highlighting the fact that crimes are wrongs. What do you mean by wrong? It is something that is the opposite of a right. So, a person had a right to something and this right was violated. So, that resulted in a wrong. And this wrong should have a sanction in the law. So, it should be written in the law that this is a wrong. And not only should it have a sanction which is punitive, that is there should be a punishment prescribed for this offense, but at the same time it should not be remissible by any private person. That is the person to whom this wrong was committed should not be able to pardon the person who committed this wrong. The only person or the only authority that should be able to pardon this wrong should be the crown or the sovereign or else it should not be pardonable at all. So, this is Professor Kenny's definition and here again you are finding that there are certain things that could be added and there are certain things could, that could be subtracted. Hulsbury laws of England state that a crime is an unlawful act or default which is an offence against the public and renders the person guilty of the act or default liable to legal punishment. So, this is one of the more standard definitions of a crime that it is unlawful. So, there should be a law and this act should be unlawful of it. That is, it should violate that law. It can be an act or a default. So, default means it can be also be an omission. So, for example, it was your duty to perform something and you did not perform that, that is a default. Act means that it can be a commission. So, you were not required or uh, basically you were prohibited from doing something, but still you did it. So, acts of commission and acts of omission, which is an offense against the public and renders the person guilty of the act or default and liable to legal punishment. Now, while a crime is also an injury to a private person, which has remedy in a civil action, it is also an act of default contrary to the order, peace and well-being of the society, which makes crime punishable by the state. So, when a crime occurs, then there is injury to a person. This injury can be made up for by the civil law, but at the same time this injury is of such a nature that the society considers that it is an affront to, to the whole of the society, to the moral fabric of the society. And this is where the role of the state comes in. And this is why the person who was wronged is not able to pardon the offender and only then we will consider this to be a crime. So, these are the various views on crimes. Then crime consists of two things. You have actus reus and mens rea. Actus means an act or a deed, reus means forbidden. So, actus reus is a forbidden deed. That is, you did something that is forbidden. But just doing this thing will not make it a crime 
it should also have a mens rea. Mens means mind, rea is crime or guilty. So, mens rea means a guilty mind or a criminal mind. So, basically just having a, a criminal mind will not make it a crime. Just doing the wrong thing will not make it a crime. You should have a criminal or a guilty mentality and then with that mentality you should do something to make you a criminal. So, this is crime, actus reus plus mens rea. Both of these things are required for something to be criminal. Now, there are four stages of a crime, which are intention, preparation, attempt and commission. So, let us now look at all four of these. A crime always begins with an intention and intention is a condition of mind and it comprises of foresight and desire. That is, you will have an intention only when you have a desire to do this criminal thing plus you also have the foresight. That is, you have some sort of a planning, some sort of a forethought. Only then it will become an intention. Mere intention to commit an offense is not punishable because in this case you have not done anything. You just have a criminal mentality, you just have a desire to do something wrong, you just have the foresight to do something wrong, but you have not done anything. So, intention is never punishable. More so because for uh, in a large part intention is also hidden. You do not uh, make it overt and so intention is not punishable and intention is not the same as motive. Motive is the ulterior or underlying or hidden objective which prompts a person to form an intention. That is, suppose A had a very bad behavior with B and this bad behavior can be a motive for B to plan something against A. So, that would be the motive. But with this motive, if B thinks that I am going to murder this person, then that becomes the intention. So, motive is the force that is propelling a person to form an intention. But motive is not the same as intention. Motive is something that is forcing you toward to make an intention. But once you make the intention, you have moved towards the crime. Because even though there can be a motive, it is possible that the person is able to channelize things in different ways. For example, if A had a very bad behavior towards B, then B has a motive to redress his wrongs. But it is not necessary that B should murder A. Probably B could file a suit in a court of law. So, that would be one way to channelize his motive. Or B could, for instance, take help of an arbitrator or a mediator or probably we can just move from the, that place, place to some other place and in none of these circumstances would be be making an intention to do the murder. So, motive is not the same as murder, motive is just the ulterior or underlying or hidden objective which prompts a person to form an intention. Now, absence of intention may be a defense, but absence of motive is not a defense. Why not? Because motive again is an ulterior objective, it is hidden, it is underlying. And so, it is possible that even without a known motive, a person makes a plan to create, uh, to commit a crime. So, for example, say uh, in the earlier circumstance, A had a very bad behavior towards B and so B was having a motive to kill A. But it is also possible that A and B never had any interaction. But then to B decides, let me kill A just for the fun of it. Now, in this case, when B makes this intention that I am going to kill A, then B does not have any motive here. And when B does not have any motive and B makes this intention, then 
we cannot say that because B did not have any motive, because B never knew A, he never had any interaction with A and so his actions should be justifiable. No, that is not going to happen. So, absence of an intention can be a crime because absence of intention would mean that there is no mens rea. But absence of a motive is not a valid defense. So, there can also be a situation that B just thinks let me kill A without any motive because A and B never had any interaction. So, in this case B would be having an intention without a motive. Now, absence of intention may be a defense because absence of intention shows that the person did not have any mens rea, but absence of motive is not a defense. If B and A never had any interaction and still B makes a plan to kill A, B has des desire to kill A without motive, then to B is committing a crime. So, this is what it says, absence of intention may be a defense, but absence of motive is not a defense. At the same time, motive, however pure and laudable, will not exonerate the criminal. So, you might be having a motive to save somebody, but even with a very good motive, even with a very good intention, if you commit a crime, then this will not make your crime null and void. For example, a, a classic example is that there is somebody who is very sick, needs a medicine, but does not have money to purchase that medicine. And a friend of that person or the child of that person goes to a medical store, robs the medical store, brings that medicine and gives it to the sick person. Now, in this case, the motive of the friend of the sick person or the child of the sick person is a very good one. He or she just wants to save the, the sick person. He or she just wants that this sick person should not die. But even with this laudable or pure motive, this person has committed a robbery or this person has committed a theft. So, what this line says is that motive, however pure and laudable, it will not exonerate the criminal. That is, the person who committed the theft will have to face the charges, even though the motive was good. So, that is about motive and intention. Next, let us have a look at preparation. Preparation is devising or arranging measures for commission of a crime. That is, once the person has made this intention that I am going to commit this crime, I am going to murder this person. And with that intention, the person goes and purchases a long knife. So, what that person has done now is that that person has done a preparation to commit the crime. So, preparation is devising or arranging measures for commission of a crime. And mere preparation to commit an offense is not punishable with certain exceptions. That is, if B made this intention that B is going to kill A, B went to a shop and purchased a long knife to kill A, still B will not be charged because he has not committed anything. He has just purchased a long knife. So, preparation in a large number of cases is not punishable, but then we have certain exceptions. So, these are the three exceptions under IPC. Section 122, preparation to wage war against the government of India. So, even though a person has not waged a war, the person has made preparations and in this case, there will be consequences. Section 126, preparation to commit depredation, which means attack or plunder on the territory of any power at peace with the government of India. Here again, the preparation will be punishable. The preparation also is an offense or a crime. And section 399, preparation to commit decoity. Even though decoity has not been committed, but if somebody makes a preparation for that, it is punishable, it is a crime. So, let us now look at these sections in more detail. Section 122, collecting arms, etc., with intention of waging war against the government of India. Now, this says collecting arms, etc., 
it means that there can be other things as well. And it explains it here, whoever collects men, arms or ammunition or otherwise, that is you can also collect other things or otherwise prepares to wage war with the intention of either waging or being prepared to wage war. That is you can either prepare to wage war or you can wage the war against the government of India shall be punished with imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description for a term not exceeding 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, whether you are prepared whether you are uh, having this intention of waging war, that is you yourself are uh, trying to start a war or you have the intention of being prepared to wage a war sometime in the future and with that intention you have done this preparation of collecting men, arms or ammunition or may, made some other preparations, then this is a crime and it shall be punishable with imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description, simple or uh, rigorous imprisonment for a term not exceeding 10 years and there shall also be a liability to fine. Section 126, committing depredation that is an attack or plunder on territories of power at peace with government of India. Whoever commits depredation or makes preparations to commit depredation on the territories of any power in alliance or at peace with the government of India shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine and to forfeiture of any property used or intended to be used in committing such depredation or acquired by such depredation. Now, this again is a crime and this is a crime of preparation. Then section 399, making preparation to commit decoity and decoity is defined in section 391, when five or more persons conjointly commit or attempt to commit a robbery or where the whole number of persons conjointly committing or attempting to commit a robbery and persons present and aiding such commission or attempt amount to five or more. Every person so committing, attempting or aiding is said to commit decoity. That is basically decoity in simple words is a robbery that is done by five or more persons and those five or more persons can be either present during this robbery or they can be aiding in certain ways. So, this is decoity and section 399 makes preparation to commit decoity a crime. That is whoever makes any preparation for committing decoity shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, what we have seen here is that preparation to make certain things is also criminal. It is also an offense and there are certain punishments for that. Next, let us have a look at attempt. Attempt is direct movement towards the commission of a crime after the preparation has been completed. So, in the four stages, first of all the person made an intention to, to commit the crime, then the person made a preparation and after preparation the direct movement towards commission is the attempt. Now, attempts are dealt with in uh, IPC and in three ways. The first way is that the principal offense and attempt are dealt with and made punishable by the same section. A good example is section 121, waging war against the government of India. So, in certain sections of the IPC, the offence that is committing the offence and attempt to commit the offence are both punishable in the same section such as section 121. Now, section 121 says, whoever wages war against the government of India or attempts to wage such a war. Now, in this line, you have this wages war is commission or attempts to wage is an attempt. So, whoever wages war against the government of India or attempts to wage such war or abets the waging of such war shall be punished with death, imprisonment for life and shall 
uh, also be liable to fine. So, in this case waging the war, attempting to wage the war and abetting the way uh, and abetting the waging of war are all made criminal offenses. There is an illustration A joins an, e, an insurrection. Insurrection is a violent uprising against an authority or government. So, A is basically joining a revolt against the government of India and by joining it A has committed the offense defined in this section. Another way certain attempts are dealt with is that principal offense and attempt to commit the offense are dealt with in different sections and are given different punishments. For example, section 302 is murder and section 307 is attempt to murder. In the previous case, both the waging of war and attempt to wage the war have the same punishment. But in this case, uh, and they are in the same section 121, but in this case, the murder and attempt to murder are in different sections and are also prescribed different punishments. What are these? Section 302 punishment for murder, whoever commits murder shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So, this is for commission, whoever commits murder. Section 307 is attempt for murder, whoever does any act with such intention or knowledge and under such circumstances that if he by that act caused death, he would be guilty of murder, shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, basically what it is saying here is that somebody is doing certain act with intention or knowledge. So, there is an intention and murder would have caused or murder would have resulted if the act had caused death. But for, for some circumstances, the death was not caused. So, in that case, it is an attempt to murder. Now, in the previous case, for murder you had uh, either death penalty or imprisonment for life. But in the case of attempt to murder, it is um, up imprisonment up to 10 years and fine. So, there is a difference. So, you have two different sections and you have two different punishments. And if hurt is caused to any person by such act, the offender shall be liable either to imprisonment for life or to such punishment as is herein before mentioned. That is a person caused an attempt to murder and the attempt failed. So, somebody fired a shot to kill somebody and missed it. So, in this case it has become an attempt to murder and in the case of attempt to murder, you will have imprisonment up to 10 years and fine. Now, the person who shot uh, the bullet, it is also possible that this bullet hit the person and there was a hurt that was caused. Now, even though hurt was caused, the person was not having an intention to cause the hurt. The person was having the intention to kill the, the other person. So, in this case as well, there will be an attempt to murder, but which has also resulted in hurt. And the section 307 says that in such a case where hurt is also there, you will have imprisonment for life or such punishment as in here in before mentioned, which means imprisonment up to 10 years and or fine. Then it also defines attempts by life convicts. When any person offending under this section is under sentence of imprisonment for life, he may, if hurt is caused, be punished with death. So, there is a higher penalty or a more serious penalty for those people who are already under a sentence of imprisonment for life. So, if such a person attempts to murder, and has also caused hurt, then this person might be given a death penalty. So, that is the commission and attempt being dealt with in two different sections and with two different punishments. So, this is another way in which commission and attempt 
are dealt with under IPC. Now, section 307 also gives you certain illustrations. A shoots at Z with intention to kill him under such circumstances that if death ensued, A would be guilty of murder. Now, in this case, because A has already shot at Z with the intention to kill him, so A is liable to punishment under this section. That is, A has already committed an attempt to murder. Now, A with the intention of causing the death of a child of tender years exposes it in a desert place. A has committed the offense defined in this section though the death of the child does not ensue. That is, A has performed the attempt of causing the death by exposing the child in a desert place. Now, even though this child was rescued and did not die, but still A has committed the offense defined by this section which is the attempt to murder. Another example is A intending to murder Z buys a gun and loads it. So, A is having an intention and has bought a gun and loaded it means that A has also done the preparation, but A has not yet committed the offense because preparation is not an offense. But then A fires the gun at Z. As soon as A fires the gun at Z, he has committed the offense defined in this section. So, A has committed the offense of attempt to murder as soon as he has fired the gun. And if by such firing he wounds Z, so in that case he has caused hurt as well. So, he is liable to the punishment provided by the latter part of the first paragraph of this section. Then A intending to murder Z by poison, so A has the intention, then A purchases poison and mixes the same with food. As soon as he has done this, he has performed preparation to commit the crime. So, there is intention, there is preparation, but this food remains in A's keeping. So, because you only have intention and preparation, so A has not yet committed the offense defined in this section. But then A places the food on Z's table or delivers it to Z's servants to place it on Z's table. As soon as A has done this part, he has performed the attempt. So, A has committed the offense defined in this section, that is attempt to murder. Another way in which uh, attempts are dealt with in IPC are that attempt to commit the offense is not expressly provided for. And for all of these, they are covered under section 511 of IPC, which is the general section for attempts. So, we have seen that there are three ways. One, principal offense and attempt are dealt with and made punishable by the same section. So, you have the same section that deals with commission and attempt and also gives the same punishment. The second way is that commission and attempt are dealt with in different sections and have different punishments. And the third case is you have certain offenses in which attempts are not provided for. So, there is no section that talks about attempt to commit these offenses. For example, section 379 is theft, but there is no section that says attempt to theft. And so, Attempt to theft will be dealt with under section 511, which is the general section for all different kinds of attempts. So, these are three ways of dealing with attempts. Now, let us look at these two sections. Section 379, punishment for theft. Whoever commits theft shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years or with fine or with both, whoever commits theft. So, unlike the previous section, it does not say whoever commits or attempts to commit, that is not there. It only talks about commission of theft, that is somebody has already done theft. So, in this case, the punishment is imprisonment. Now, imprisonment here is important, we will see it uh, shortly. So, imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years or with fine or with both. 
So this is punishment for theft. And what does section 511 say? It says punishment for attempting to commit offenses punishable with imprisonment of life or other imprisonment. That is, this section does not deal with those offenses that are punishable only with a fine. You need to have an offense that is punishable either with uh, imprisonment for life or with some other imprisonment, but just fines will not do. So, the section says, whoever attempts to commit an offense punishable by this code with imprisonment for life or imprisonment or to cause such an offense to be committed and in such attempt does any act towards the commission of the offense shall where no express provision is made by this code for the punishment of such attempt be punished with imprisonment of any description provided for the offense for a term which may extend to one half of the imprisonment for life or as the case may be one half of the longest term of imprisonment provided for that offense or with such fine as is provided for the offense or with both. That is what does this section say? There should be an offense and this offense should be punishable with imprisonment either for life or for some other term and there should be an attempt to commit this offense and at the same time there should not be any express provision in this code for the punishment of such attempt. So, if there is an express provision such as attempt for attempt to murder then this section will not apply, but if there is no express provision only in the in such cases there shall be a punishment which is imprisonment of half of the term originally provided for the commission. So, if the commission said that the person will be imprisoned for life, so in this case it will be imprisonment to, uh, for half of that sentence or say if the, com if the section for commission said that you will have an imprisonment for 3 years, in that case for attempt you will have imprisonment for 3 by 2 that is 1 and a half years. So, the term of imprisonment will be halved, but the kind of imprisonment that is imprisonment of any description that is provided for the offense. If it is simple imprisonment, it will remain as simple imprisonment. If it is rigorous imprisonment, it will remain as a rigorous imprisonment. So, the description will not change, the time will be halved and the fine will be the same as before. So, the fine for committing an attempt will be the same as the fine for committing the offense as such. So, when all of these conditions are met, then this fine, uh, then uh, this uh, punishment shall be awarded for the attempt of the offense. Now, there are certain illustrations. A makes an attempt to steal some jewels by breaking open a box and finds after so opening the box that there is no jewel in it. So, there are certain jewels or certain ornaments that A thinks are there in a certain box and with the intention to steal these jewels, probably he has also made certain preparations and then he has broken this box. So, he has already made certain attempts to open the box, but after opening A finds that there is no jewel, there is no ornament in, in it. So, this will not uh, leave him as such because he has already done an act towards the commission of the theft and an act towards commission is an attempt and is therefore guilty under this section. Another example is A makes an attempt to pick the pocket of Z by thrusting his hand into Z's pocket. So, A had the intention to pick the pocket. A probably also made certain preparations. He probably placed himself in such a location where he will be able to put his hand inside Z's pocket and he put his hand into Z's pocket. 
but z did not have anything in his pocket so a fails in the attempt in consequence of z's having nothing in his pocket so z uh, so a has not committed the crime of theft he has failed to commit the crime of theft but he has made an attempt and because he has made this attempt so a is guilty under this section so this is another way in which the attempts to crimes or attempts to offenses are dealt with under ipc section 511 so section 511 will only apply when there is an attempt to commit a crime and that crime should be punishable with certain imprisonment if it is only punishable with a fine then section 511 does not apply next the crime for which the attempt is made the attempt should not be expressly provided for anywhere in IPC. If there is an express provision for the attempt of certain crimes, then this section again will not hold. And if all of these things happen and there is an attempt, then there will be a punishment which is half of the sentence of either description plus the whole of the fine. So that is section 511. Then after attempt, we have the commission of the crime. Commission is the act of committing a crime or an offense. So the person began with an intention to perform the crime. The person made certain preparations to commit the crime. The person attempted to make the crime and the attempt was successful. When the attempt is successful, we'll say that the person has committed the crime, the person has committed the offense. So, commission is the action of committing a crime or an offense. So, all of these things they have worked and the crime has been committed, then we will say that a commission has happened. And commission is always punishable. So, this is the gist of punishment. If the commission has occurred, it means that all the four things have happened the person made an intention which means that the person had a guilty mind the person had a criminal mind with which that person made the intention then he or she made the preparation to commit the crime he or she made an attempt to commit the crime and this attempt was successful then there is a commission and when all these four things have happened no doubt it will be punishable so, this is what we saw in this particular lecture. This is the recap. The first thing we looked at is what is crime. So, crime is difficult to define, but we can always say that crime consists of two things. Two things have to happen. You need to have an actus reus, that is a forbidden deed, and you need to have mens rea, that is a guilty mind. For example, we have seen before that suppose you went into a classroom and it is a rainy day and you left your umbrella outside as did all the other students of your class. And while going back, you picked up an umbrella thinking that it is your umbrella. But you picked up the umbrella of one of your friends or one of your classmates. So even though you have done a forbidden deed, that is you have taken the property of somebody without paying for it or without taking his or her permission even though you have done this act but still because you do not have a guilty mind because you did not intend to commit this theft it is not a crime so both of these things have to happen you need to do an a forbidden act and you need to have a guilty mind or suppose you had a guilty mind you wanted to create a theft you wanted to commit this theft and you wanted to, to take somebody's umbrella, but you are unable to do that. Why? Because by, by the time you came out, everybody had taken their umbrellas. So, in this case, even though you have a guilty mind, but because you are unable to perform the forbidden deed, so it is not a crime. So, crime is actus reus plus mens rea. Both of these things have to occur at the same time. Then 
the physical element that is actus reus could be an omission or an act that is it can be an omission or a commission for example you were ordained by law suppose there is a doctor and the doctor is ordained by law to take care of his patients and the the doctor does not take care of his patients and because of a negligence a patient dies so in this case the doctor had com has committed an omission so the physical element can be an omission as well and it can also be a commission that is somebody goes and murders somebody so this person has committed a murder so you can have commission or omission for actus reus then we saw that there are four stages of a crime intention preparation attempt and commission so intention is making up of the mind that somebody thinks okay i am going to steal from this person i am going to rob this bank i am going to murder this person all of these are intentions with intention the next stage comes is preparation that is if somebody wants to rob a bank the person has started to go about looking at the schedules of various people who are working in the bank the person is now trying to note down what is the time when you have the least number of security guards which is the day when the bank has the largest amount of money all of these are preparations the person suppose hires a car as a getaway vehicle the person enlists the help of certain other people so that they can say uh, act as a distraction or they can help to subdue the security guards or they can help to open the bank vaults and so on all of these things are preparation and preparation until preparation most of the things are not crime with certain exceptions then next you have the attempt so you made all the preparations and then you went to rob the bank and as soon as you begin the process you have committed the attempt to robbing the bank and if you are successful in robbing the bank you have reached the stage of commission then we also saw that motive is not the same as intention intention is making up of the mind whereas motive is the force that persuades somebody to make the intention and because it is just a force that helps you to make an intention or helps somebody to make an intention motive is not a necessary portion of a crime that is absence of an intention is a valid defense in the case of the umbrella example you can say oh i never wanted to take the umbrella of my fellow classmate i just wanted to do, to take my own umbrella i never had the intention to steal and so that is a valid defense but absence of a motive is not a valid defense now intention is never punishable because intention is within yourself so preparation is punishable only with these three cases and these three cases are the exceptional cases not only because they are provided for as such in the ipc but also because all three of these are very serious offenses preparation to wage war against the government of india waging war against your own nation or waging war against the nation that is making these laws of course this will be a very serious offense and so preparation to do this offense is also taken very seriously similarly when we talk about preparation to commit depredation that is an attack or a plunder on the territory of any power at peace with government of india if somebody does that what will happen is that the country that is with peace with the government of india that country might also start to wage a war against india so if somebody commits a crime as grave as this it will have consequences for the state of india and so because the this 
uh, offence is so grievous, it is so grave. So, the preparation for this offence has also been made punishable. Third is preparation to commit decoity. Decoity as we have seen is robbery that is done with five and more people. Preparation to commit a robbery is not punishable, but when you consider decoity, it is a very large scale robbery. It is a robbery that, re that requires the help of a large number of people, five or more. And because this is a very large affront to the society, it will probably also result in the loss of life of certain people. And so, because it is so grave an offence, so its preparation has also been made punishable. So, these are the only three crimes for which the preparation has been made punishable. For the rest, preparation is not punishable. Next, we have attempt. Attempt is punishable for offences that are punishable with imprisonment. And we have seen that attempts are dealt with in IPC in three different ways. For certain offences, the commission and attempt are both made punishable in the same section with the same punishment. For example, section 121. In certain cases, the commission is dealt with in a separate section and the attempt is dealt with in a separate section and both of these have different punishments. A good example is murder. So, for murder, the attempt is dealt with in section 307 and the commission is dealt with in section 302. So, you have attempt and commission being dealt with in two different sections and both these sections provide different punishments. In the case of attempt, the punishment also varies depending on whether or not the person was able to cause hurt to the affected party or not. Then in the case of attempt for uh, attempt to murder, it also includes things of omission like leaving a child in a deserted place. So, attempts are punishable for offences punishable with imprisonment. Then the third way in which the attempt is dealt with is through section 511. Now, section 511 states that if there is a crime that is punishable with an imprisonment, either imprisonment for life or imprisonment for a certain term and this uh, and the attempt to do this crime is has not been made punishable expressly anywhere in the IPC, then section 511 will apply and the attempt is made punishable under section 511 with the punishment which is half of the original punishment that is half of the punishment that is prescribed for the commission of the offence. If the commission of the offence entails a punishment of life imprisonment, the attempt would give you half of life imprisonment. If the commission says that you will be imprisoned for 7 years, the attempt would be punishable for 7 by 2 that is 3 and a half years. So, half the term of either way. So, it can be a simple imprisonment or a rigorous imprisonment the same as that was provided for the commission and there will also be a fine and the quantum of the fine is the same as what was provided for the commission. So, these are three different ways in which IPC deals with attempts. Then the fourth thing is commission. Now, commission is the stage where you did all three of these and the attempt was also successful. So, the person made an intention to commit a crime that is the person had a guilty mind, the person made a preparation to commit the crime. So, the person arranged for all different sorts of things, different kinds of equipment, men, material and so on to commit the crime. And then the person also did what was required to commit the crime. The person for instance opened a box or broke open a lock 
or put his hand into somebody's pocket or fired a gun. So, all of these things are attempts and with this attempt the person was also successful. So, if the person was trying to steal something, he not only broke the lock but was also able to take that thing away. The person who was trying to pickpocket not only put his hands into somebody's pocket but was also able to take away the wallet. The person who was trying to kill somebody by shooting a bullet was also able to kill some the person. So, in all of these cases when the attempt is successful it becomes a commission and commission is always punishable. The whole of IPC mostly deals with commission of offenses. So, it defines offenses and when we say definition of offenses it is the definition of commission of offenses. When it prescribes punishments for offenses, it is prescribing the punishments for commission of offenses. So, commission is always punishable. So, this is something that needs to be remembered. So, in this lecture, we had a look at what a crime is, how do we define a crime, what are the components of crime, what are the different stages of crime, whether it is intention, preparation, attempt or commission. Then we also looked at how all of these things are dealt with under our law, especially under the IPC. So, intention is never punishable, preparation is punishable only in exceptional cases, attempt is sometimes punishable and commission is always punishable. So, we looked at all of these in this lecture. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind. Thank you.